helping people that maybe they didn't have high education and they can um, help with kind of like uh, young people working with glass, working with wood, I don't know. So I'm interested in what other kind of activities uh, will you present and will you, uh, you know, ex expose and I don't know, also uh, when you want to get money to build these projects, you really need to think about this. So I'm especially interested in that. And I have another little question. Um, I know that you do also did something similar in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. well, and it was really successful as far as I know. Yeah. It, it, it was there for years. Yeah. Um, so that's great. And I would like to know if you have other examples of other models that inspired you or that were successful in, I don't know, other cities or, I don't know, like examples of places like this that were successful and they've been going on for a long time because they were socially sustained. And I answer the first question in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, of course, uh, we thought a lot about how we can try and, and not to get in the same scheme of getting a happy place or whatever. Mm -hmm. So so we talked to social, there's a lot of like social initiatives in a wedding who do like help for young kids with school work, who have um, projects where they teach a woman German and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we want to invite them in the place so that they become uh, visible. So we work together with the groups that are there already and and so they can use our space and that's how we get them in, for instance. Um, that's one example. I'll also talk about, I'll really address that question a little bit too, mm -hmm. is that we have a strategy behind mm -hmm. how we're developing events. Okay? Um, for instance, how do we bring these different constituencies of people together in different cultures, different languages, all this stuff? All right. What we're doing is we're trying to look and see what are the what what needs do we have that are universal, right? For instance, I think it's fair to say that in every culture and people of all ages have the need to play and have fun. Reasonable, right? It's part of your culture. Everybody's got that, right? So, for instance, what we'll do is game night. Okay, everybody brings a game. So I want a new Turkish game, a little this game, this game, this game, game night. So we have, we have, what we're trying to do is first identify and look at what, we, and there's a whole map of this. This is actually another project that's on the side that's actually kind of the roots of this thing, which we're not going to get too deep into tonight. But you can look online, I can send you links, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And it's really a way of you know, looking at what our needs are. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're developing content, by, by finding what it is that we're really after, you know, deep down inside ourselves, that we share. And then we build stuff around the events around that. Okay, about this other question about how do you avoid becoming some of the regular another thing, and has that where else has been successful? Well, I got to tell you, one thing that's really important in making a, a, a space socially successful is what the vibe is like, and that really it's like everything. It's like who's there, what music is there, how the space looks, how comfortable it is, what's happening, content wise in the space, all this other stuff. And, and I, I can only tell you this. Um, I was in New York City for several, several years, and, and New York is very much about the spectacle and a big and loud and entertaining and crazy and spec, you know, blah, 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 more and more. And there's lots of that, and people are kind of, ah, having fun, yeah, I'm drinking. You know. But um, the types of events that, that we were able to create would be like, imagine this, imagine you walk into a room full of 150 people and you feel like you can walk up to any single person in that room, no problem, just walk right up to somebody, feel cold enough to one and strike up a great conversation. And that was the type of vibe that we were able to create in New York City, which is a very stressed, intense place. In the 17 years that I had this studio, this law space we did these events in, which is open door, and you got like next to the projects or the crackheads and, and so far. And when I first moved in the building, get this: the mafia used to dump their bodies behind our building in New York City under the Manhattan Bridge. This was a, a popular dumping ground. We met my, my roommate and I right, when I first moved there. We reported the last body that got dumped there from a hit the mafia, right? Seventy years of doing stuff in this place, never once had anything broken 
stolen, lost, or some kind of crap. The worst thing we had was we had like a, a scuffle in the hallway once. And because the vibe that was there was so strong, people would walk into space and, ref and respect the fact that they had, wow, I'm here, and this part of this, I'm, I can be part of it, and it's for me, and everything else is cool and groovy. And they don't want to fuck anything up. You put people in that situation, that vibe, that's the tool. That's what, that's, that's, that's what we want to create. We want to create the conditions to have good experiences, to have good, positive, energetic, engaging experiences. That's how you do it. Those are the things that can be successful. Scott, I want to add something to that. Um, Movement. Uh, my experience, my recent experience working for the UN for the past like a couple of months in New York actually, yeah. was that I learned something from my own generation, and it, which is pretty much what we are here. And it's the transition about uh, having this knowledge of the school and the transition to become an independent person. And it's probably to get a job, to find a nice job, which is called a decent job from the UN. And what they're looking for right now is how are we going to train this new generation of youth, especially what I'm working right now, it's urban youth employment. And it, it's, it's how all these, through art, through economics, through financial, through any career, how to get this transition of the real world. And they are really focused on working on the rights of the youth, as an example. And uh, another example is focus on the girl. I mean, girls from 12 years old to the 25 years old to become independent, to become powerful. And I mean, this is all examples that I learned. Uh, this is another, another thing, this is about how to get soft skills for you, for, for, for we. It doesn't matter if you go to Harvard, if you go to whatever university in the world, anything. You don't know the soft skills, which is how to create a critical knowledge or how to develop uh, a speech which is something, how to convince, how to convince the people. Are you, t are you trying to convince me with your art? And we don't, we don't have those skills. I mean, I, I put myself in those moments because I, I come from a university, but I still don't, I mean, I work as an entrepreneur, but I did it on myself. But one of the things from, from this kind of egg, if I could call it, is that we need to have, we need to, need, we need to know how to eat the world. And that's a transition. And the, a lot of generation is lost in that transition, which in terms is unemployment. In terms of what is the rate of unemployment in the world, I mean, it's crazy. And more young generation, more young people, young people, they don't know. I mean, you can go to the School of Economics in Oxford or whatever, but you're not going to find a job, man, so, or girl. So. It's going to be really, really difficult. And most of the times, those traditional careers, like a lawyer, economic, artist, whatever, they're no longer normal careers. I mean, don't believe that you're going to get a, a job being a lawyer. Just, it does, doesn't belong. So that transition, we don't know those kids. We don't know how to speak. We don't know how to see. We don't know anything. So at this moment, the UN has focused the whole efforts in all the agencies uh, on youth, specifically on youth, especially um, girls from, from 12 years old to 25 to 35 years, guys, people like us, you know, like people like John, we don't know how to find a job or create a job. So that's the main challenge of the UN which is working right now. Actually just the past week, the last week, the UN just declared the first international day of girls. Girls, you know, girls like baby girls, not women, but girls. For the first time, they didn't have that. So I didn't know that. So, how the girls are so powerful to become independent, and how a girl, if you say a girl, what you're doing here in Berlin, as you said, this is a global thinking. We are global citizens. How can you help a girl in Africa, in Thailand, in Mexico, in Alaska? So I think this is the, I mean, with the question that uh, my friend asked where we going and this is where we have to go. And this is pretty much a really brave initiative. Uh, I think okay, about the initiative too, and as an architect, I, I recently had the experience of being in a hotel in uh, Manhattan, it's designed by uh, people associated with Donald Trump. I met someone there and says, how do you like this place? And I said, well, it really sucks. And it did. 
It was all like bronze glass, mm. straight lines. Everything came out of machines. Everything was extruded, literally. All the building parts, the glass plates were flat. Everything was extruded, pumped out by machines run by robots. At one time, every human being in the world who was alive was employed. We had 100% employment. It was called hunter-gatherer society. And then we invented agriculture. And so now we had some people that were surplus. And we created some new ideas, pyramids, and stuff like that. You know, and other things you know, to gather, you know, to get people employment, warfare, other stuff like that. You know? All of those things. And now we've come to a place, I think, that like 1.5% of the people in the United States work as in agriculture. And the United States, for what it's worth, produces huge surpluses of agriculture. In the United States 150 years ago, 125 years ago, 60% of the people were in agriculture, 25% of the people worked as, per, as, as uh, personal servants. That's what they did. They did the laundry, they carried the horses for the rich, you know, and so on. And then gradually, you know, the Industrial Revolution happened. We're, we've come to a new place, I think, where like a very small percentage of people are, make, are going to create all of the things that could be created. The one form of employment, I think, that is unending in its potential is aesthetic improvement. There's no limit to how much you can improve the aesthetic quality of human life. And somehow or other, to create a society that supports us, and maybe this little project, we're making one example of saying what it is to create an aesthetic environment where the value that we now have in giving to each other how people support themselves in aesthetic activities you said just call art, but now it's art, it's architecture, it's pottery, it's, it's everything. You know, and I know like in the States where the areas where people are doing well, strangely enough, are like higher end cooking. People learning how to do that. Organic agriculture, which in itself is an aesthetic statement about agriculture and about the preservation of the world. And a lot of aesthetic stuff. And meanwhile, the corporate thing is big projects that are all straight lines and you know, squeeze out the most, to process the most people through it, get the most dollars. And, and people go through that stuff, you know, and they go to some club in Jamaica where they live on the shoreline and 100 meters in from the shoreline and they call it sandals or whatever. And then the other side of that road is like fucking hell. Mm -hmm. People are screaming. Bye. You know, they sing in the fields because they don't want to be screaming, you know. And there's armed guards. You know, but everyone says, oh, I love Jamaica, it was so great, the water, the thing. I said, yeah, what the fuck do you know? Did you ever get in the car and drive across Jamaica? Or you go to Kingston and go in the car and drive around and see barefoot people in those cities? I mean, they're not barefoot because it's like a preferred thing to do. You know? So I just think that there's something here, and I don't know how it will end up working. But somehow by it being aesthetic, you know, doing things that are aesthetic, Personally, and the things that we do, and the businesses that we run, the kinds of public things that we try and support, we're contributing to some reason to human beings to stay on the planet. Or well, Carol, I'd add to that too, I think. Yeah, certain things. Um, I think also normally places are not built, I think, with the main purpose of meeting each other. Like public places, you have like cinema, cinemas or shops or whatever, it's always there for consuming as individual. So there are not many public places that are actually build for people just meeting. Um, if I, but and I thought about that because you said, like you end things about uh, yeah, about making young people a stronger, right? To make each person with the with the better skills. I think at the moment we see with the neighborhood gardens, with the Occupy and so on, that the strength comes of people getting together and people talk to each other and people just uh, meet themselves where they are and start and think about like um, about, uh, how they can support themselves. So I think this idea of getting stronger through getting together and actually talking to each other and have spaces for that. That's what I find yeah, the most interesting. An aesthetic statement. Yeah. To make it comfortable. What was this, this gentleman here saying? Well, I want to get back to the one, the root of what you were saying. Or you started with something about jobs, right? Yeah. You got, you got to realize something here that 
okay, jobs and, and the whole, this whole capitalist system that we, we live in. Yet, first of all, the whole capitalist model is not meant to create balance in the world. The capitalist model is meant to manage imbalance. Okay, so let's start from there. And you made a great point, uh, point about saying that everybody was you know, employed you know, at one point. Everybody could be employed again if we had, say, for instance, the goal of our time here on Earth is to make it so that we can live more humanely and in balance with nature. And if we made that as a goal, there's so much work to do that everybody could be employed again. But I don't think the problem is employment. I think what the goal that we should be working towards, in fact, is unemployment. Because there are so many things that we can produce, our food, our clothing, our the things we why do we why is it necessary that, that I go to work every day and sit at my desk and be a key account manager for the widget acne widget company that makes widget or makes apps for um, games on the iPhone G4 platform that allow you to eat little monsters and get more advertising dollars so that the cracker company who responds to you could what what are you doing at the end of your day? Ask yourself this. At the end of every day, what have I contributed to the world? What are the effects of the fruits of my labors? If people stop and ask that question and think about it, that is going to be the, the key to getting us to, to, to transitioning into redefining what we value, redefining our systems. Redefining how that's the question here is that is, that is it. We see that the constructs are broken. The question is how are we going? What are we going to recreate to, to replace them? And how's that transition going to work, right? And that needs to be an active conversation, right, between a lot of people. And even one step further, not only is that an active conversation between what are the, the new constructs, but who are we designing the constructs for? Us. And there's so many things we don't even understand about ourselves. And that's the, the first level that without, we don't need government, we don't need money, we don't need anything. We don't need, we don't need shit. All we need is us talking about it with ourselves in order to address things on that level, to learn from each other, with each other, about ourselves, and about each other. That's the first step. And that's why we need public places and spaces to come together. That's the first challenge. So, creating open places for, for great ideas and sign up to that. To make the world a better place and sign up to that. How to start that in Gerichtsstraße number 23 with a bunch of great artists, with a lot of goodwill, with, if everything works out, some money. Hopeful platform, but what do you do then? You you told us what you want to do once the place is run with the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, do you have an idea of how you involve your neighborhood in actually making this place? I mean, here you have an icon, there you have people with goodwill. How do you get the neighborhood kids in there? How do you get somebody from the Entertainment seeking crowd in line in front of the Stadtbar, walking across the street and, and, and putting in his share, his hand. They already yeah. are. They already are. Two people who used to live over at the Stadtbar are two of our main helpers, one of them's in our film. Kids from the Turkish neighborhood, they used to come and smoke in our hallway and pee in the hallway, are now guys who help us out and help us carry shit around. They're spreading all the words to their friends. The guy who's the Turkish guy who runs the internet store where people go and buy their phones, and everybody in the neighborhood goes to this one place. It's only because it's open late till midnight. So people go over there for beer, cigarettes, and this guy spreads our cards, talks about our projects, and then he hooks us up with people. They already are, it's already happening. Because the only way we can do this is to do it in a very real way where people see, believe, and participate to create that reality. And that's the way you do it. You do it by doing it for real. Do you want to respond to that? I would like to push another question to that, and right where you are now. Um, it's kind of a metaphor. At the north end of Mauer Park, 
they created a nice open space, and I don't know the technical term. It's open space where things can grow, things that are natural to a city environment. And now five years down the road, you have a kind of howling water pump, and big weeds were the stuff that you put in your goose has overgrown everything else. In other words, just the open space by itself in urban nature didn't exactly work out to get what the great idea was at the beginning. How do you want to ensure that, that your project keeps the idea or, 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 or actually serves the idea to make the world a better place and doesn't end up to be a place where that, that, that is misused in many ways to make the world a worse place. Well, give me an example of how it would be used to make the world a worse place. Well, I can run my app producing cracker junk food incentive right from your Wi-Fi space in your bar using subsidy, subsidized food. Well, look, every time you come over, you watch porn. I mean, I didn't do that. I think that's the skills, it. but some of them I mean, but you can't, you can't police people, you know what I mean? But what you can do is you can provide uh, the, uh, the ideas for initiative for people to work on, for people to come together. You know, like, uh, hey, we need some new bike racks because, like, this is a real, very real problem in our neighborhood. There's no, not enough bike racks, right? We have a metal shop right around the corner. We got people who are, we got tons of, you know, materials cheap. It's just about now, it's about labor. Now, if we're getting bike racks and we get these guys up from across the street, hey, we're making new bike racks. If you come and help us weld the stuff and do the labor, then we'll make a bunch and you'll have some from in front of your building too. I just, that's just, a, I just pulled that out of my ass. So you want to provide a hands-on experience? Well, now, yeah, building, sometimes it's building, sometimes it's systems. Hey, look, we got a, um, uh, um, what's a good uh, systems thing? Um, oh, I can do that. Um, let's say, um, okay, um, a big pro real problem in our neighborhood is that cars, sometimes these, these guys race up and down the street really fast. They almost drag race. And it's like, you know, there's kids around. I mean, my kid walks around there too, you know? And, uh, and they blow right through this crosswalk thing. Like, well, what could we do as a, as a systems kind of thing to, to stop that? Um, try to lobby to get speed bumps put up there. Or maybe maybe we take we paint an outline of somebody who got hit in the street. And I put that out of artwork to get people to think about it. You know, like, what are you doing? So maybe, I don't know, there's different ways, there's different problems that we could need to actually approach and, and get people together on that. So. How do you stop people? I'm not worried about stopping people from doing something terrible. What I'm worried about is inspiring them to do something good. That's the short answer. So it's sort of like spending the energy on a constructive side and not putting the energy into fighting um, mm -hmm. what, I don't know, the law is already try, trying to, yeah. to fight and isn't successful in doing. Yeah. So um, there was another question over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask um, if that's okay. Um, like, you will be the guys who will um, sustain this and who will take up the loan and take the risk and everything. So, um, will you have to work in other jobs, like to um, to make your living, or is it um, for you um, a way to make your living and to keep this going? And how does this? work because all the good things you just said, they're things that are for free pretty much. So how, mm -hmm. or will you rent out some space as well? Or I'm just curious about that. Right, true. Um, well, there's there's like a rent on the place, right? And mm -hmm. we plan to work like full time for that, but yes, so we would like to live from that. Um, the idea is basically first, there will be a cafe built in the space, so that will sell like organic, vegan, local food, you know. And so that will be part of it. Then all the space is art, so you can buy the art and you get a percentage of that. Um, then if there are some e events, we can take a bit of entrance, ask for donations from the people, and we can partly rent out space for some hours for groups. 
Uh, so like for instance, if I say like that we invite neighborhood groups to use the space, right? Mm -hmm. So for people for groups get down with money, it's it's about free, and for people who have money, they can pay over to you, right? Okay. Um, so yes, it's it is planned as a business, but as a social business, mm -hmm. which means our goal is to make enough money to sustain it, but to not make profit on it and get rich, but, mm -hmm. but to live from it and to pay people who work there. Um, so that's that's a goal. Yes. Okay. There's another there's another part of that too. There's another part of that thing is that not only do we do we will also be selling products out of the space like design products from people with their ideas that are organic and that are sustainable, right? That people produce. Now on top of that, after our first year of basically running the space off the the cafe events bar products stuff, we're in the process of developing a design consultancy. Because there are so many designers that we know who are clever and brilliant geniuses. So for instance, the guys who started, who were behind, who I started out with, who developed all the concepts that we're working now, one of the guys that had a design at, at uh, Adidas. You know, genius guys. Another guy is a head of design at Timberland. I mean, they wouldn't be shoes, so they don't ask me why. But um, what we want to do is design, a, start a, a design solutions consultancy that does product design, furniture, interior, systems, graphics, Video. Ultimately, what we'd love to do, we'd be able to do, is position ourselves as a as a as a media outlet, and where our, our balance is between face to face media and online media. And what we'd like to put out there is like instead of like the news, all the shitty things that happened in the world, we want to put out the good news, things that you can use in your life. What's happening around? Somebody discovered, or a system, or an idea things that you can actually take in your life and use them. That's what we want to start to position ourselves as. So there are many different levels and layers of, of this of this project. And I also think at the moment, um, now you still get lots of state funding. As it looks like in the next years, there will be some uh, social cuts. So question is how you can make social projects are like um, a finance for the next years. And we thought, you know, try it as a business model for, for secure in finance. I was thinking something else, uh, because it's, like you said, it's in Wedding, it's in a uh, Turkish neighborhood where you place, where the place will be. And uh, you just mentioned the organic bagels, you know, this is actually gentrification in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, it's a problem, right? It's a total problem, that's gentrification. Um, gentrification is happening there already, right? The rents go up, you have lots of academics, you have creatives moving in, there's a gentrification at the moment, full blow in that street. Wow. It's well, like it's, it's, it's starting. It's, 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 it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Oh, let's also say that gentrification is happening somewhere. I think it's a really good idea to redefine the quality of life and its objects and the surroundings that people call gentrification. It doesn't all have to be Shiny marble spaces, gyms, and all the other crap that they put in these places. It can be a whole lot of other things, like paintings. It can be handmade objects. It can be that every place has an individuality to it. And then people start looking. Upscale is individual. It's different. And in a way, I'm, I'm making a little money on this. I spend it on my bank. I'm doing the same thing. Sure. I really believe in the risk redistribution of money from the very wealthy. Right, but, me, but um, you know, I try and do as much of that social as possible. But at the same time, I think you know, if everything heads heads like towards McDonald's, heads towards some kind of like down a tunnel where it's all extruded, we're extruded, but where has more opportunities, you know, for aesthetic statements. And the other thing, Henry Miller once said, the problem is not unemployment; the problem is employment. He wrote this many years ago in the, in the 30s. And in, in, in essence, if everyone were unemployed, in a way, in these, in these kinds of constructs, corporate constructs, but nevertheless there was a way to make a living and have a living, that would be a very interesting world. And I think, I just reiterate my, my feeling, is that aesthetics becomes a value. I mean, the one thing I found about living in New York City, where I come from, is fundamentally, most of the city is really ugly. <laughs> and you go out into all the so suburbs, fucking ugly. 
you go into the poorer areas, and even in some areas, as they gen even when they gentrify, the streets are still lousy. You know, they're still full of puddles and they're full of dirty. It's just the only thing about it is there's a huge number of really great people there and a lot of energy. But even that's beginning to subside in a certain way because it's unlivable unless you're really very wealthy. You know, like, I, one of the things I like and feel about Berlin, it seems still to be a livable urban environment. There's still an opportunity, I think, to do things here that have gone by the boards in New York City. You can't do something in New York if you would rent a space this size for a store in any reasonable place and have to spend $12,000 or 10,000 euros a month just to have this little store. You can't do anything very experimental in such a place. But that's what the kind of economic structure has taken over there, you know. So it's a different world, you know, something we want. This, this, is really, this gentrification point is really interesting because, you know, um, you talk about organic food, right? And it's like, you know, is that, does that mean gentrification? It's just an example. You know. I know, but it doesn't have to mean gentrification because you can get organic food. I'll give you an example. We are going to have a plot on a 100,000 square foot or 10,000 square foot or 10,000 yeah, 10, 10, 10, quadrat meter um, organic farm without the parking lot, single day place, is going to grow the vast majority of our food. Right? A few blocks away, locally grown organic food. We can still serve it for three euro a plate. To everybody. If you do that, that would be great. That's what the whole point is. We're not, we're not looking out to get rich on this project, right? I'll tell you what, don't, don't be wrong, I'm not allowed to make up. I'll tell you what I'd love to do. What I'd love to do is create a place that really works, right? And then go get some funding, do it somewhere else, have some other people be owners of it, right? Sell off some ownership of this place, keep, just keep spreading the idea until everybody's a little bit owner of places like this. That way we don't need to make tons of profit off it. That's not the idea. We need to, to say it's part of this whole thing of how do we shift value. And I think this for this gentrification thing, you know, we've been working on this project now for like one and a half years, so we really thought a lot about gentrification. The question is, what can you do to not make it happen? So of course, uh, uh, we could move places. That's, in, that's uh, impossible not to make it happen. You could move to Prenzlauerberg, for instance. It will happen. <laughs> it's already happened. <laughs> well, it's uh, I would add something. Also, it's about how to negotiate. I would say that word, just that simple. How to negotiate with, with the gentrification and how you're going to resilient, you know, to become a resilient city, which is something that is very interesting. I learned something from Brooklyn that uh, um, they were going to pay, to build like really luxury houses in front of the bay, uh, where you have like the old view from New York, and then negotiate like the first five floors that were for social housing, for example and the price for those apartments that were very, very cheap. And from the fifth floor, from the top, could be like luxury. But uh, you have to design like a park on the ground. So there is that negotiation that you have to learn from the, from the people, from the planning designers, from the policies, and from the people. I mean, I mean, you don't have to go. I mean, just, just move a little bit. You're going to have your own place, a nice place. I, so obviously with the policies of the government, what this uh, mayor is doing, and those, are, those are the things that, how to negotiate those things. And be together not to take them out, but just, they're just living in the same place, in a luxury place, but with a small rent from the bottom, from the bottom, with a nice uh, park in the luxury hall, obviously. That's a, that's where is it? Just in front of the bay, where, where, where is the... Um, in city? Yeah, in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. I have one quick question for you also in that regard. This is an important thing about it. Let's say if we don't build that spawn house in that space, what else could go in it that would be better? You tell me. Just about, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> think, about it. think about it. A space that's going to try to make the neighborhood better and work with the people. What could be better to go in that space? A bakery? I don't know, a casino? A school, a school, something to learn, to, tra to train, something to create. Maybe, maybe that's a weakness of the gentrification debate. That, uh, I mean, if, if, if you declare something that raises the education level, something that teaches people how to eat proper food, something that teaches people how to live a more sustainable life, if you call yeah. that gentrification, then you have two options. You either have to dump your good ideas, or you have to say gentrification can be good in a way. Yeah, so, uh, yeah exactly. Well, that's, it really depends how you communicate, and it's about communication. 
I mean, uh, of course. Uh, and I think also the Turkish neighborhood can also switch. And I don't know the kids you mentioned who piss in the you know in the, near the door and stuff like that. They could build a place together with you and then like you know do all the organic farming, farming and cook with you and stuff like that and also eat the food. I mean, this is just great if it really works. If it doesn't work, then you have like uh, you know people with who have design a job somewhere else and who work somewhere in the West who live who start move, who move into the wedding and then you will like find it quite nicely to have like this organic cafe in their neighborhood yeah. that looks so fancy and they will go there and work there on the laptop as, as mentioned already. <laughs> you know it's it's yeah. I, I don't I don't say that it doesn't work, I just say yeah. it's, there are some dangers dangers yeah. there that uh, you probably have thought about. Yeah, there, there is a danger, of course, and but what I've also like been talking to like different, you say, social health group in place, you know, like uh, small neighborhood cafes and over health and things, and they say at the moment there's a problem, you know, people have to move out because the rents go up, and because and so they have problems because they don't get funding. So I think one thing to actually make something happen that this process stops is to make it visible, right? Because, and, and so what, like one of our things, we thought, okay, so we make visible what is there in writing. And, you know, so um, to build networks together because there are many little, small groups who are there and have problems. And so this is a place where we start building networks and working together. So, I mean, we know it's there, and we can only try to find the best strategies to deal with it, to make it as best we can do it. I, I, um, I saw an interesting uh, thing in uh, Köln that uh, um, relates to what you just said. Um, it's, it's just uh, the wall of a house, and um, someone painted on it, uh, your landlord wants to raise the rents, what to do? And it was one, two, three, and two and three had to do with um, uh, don't sign anything and go, Go get some, um, some, uh, you know, um, those uh, um, associations where you can go and you get um, a lawyer basically for free or for a small fine every every uh, fine or for a small fee every uh, every year. And but the first one was um, go talk to your neighbors, talk with everyone, like get um, uh, get together, like don't stay in your in your single apartment. And so, so this is, um, and, 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 and let this all just happen and be a victim. And so, I mean, this is a, a, what you say, you want to make um, these processes visible. It's um, a, a place like yours, it's, um, it's probably um, one of the best places to meet and discuss that. And so, so the downside of gentrification can actually, well, um, by doing things yourself and not relying on, on the government of Berlin or something to, to, to fix it. I mean, of course, they should do something, and maybe you could even, in, in the Bahamas, you could even um, uh, start initiatives um, uh, fighting that. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think a place like, like yours has, will have, the, I mean, will have the power to, to, to work against the negative effects of gentrification. And um, what's the other thing I wanted to say? What you uh, were saying about the unemployment thing? Um, just a just a side note that um, uh, the I think a big problem is that most people's um, well sense of self worth um, they derive from 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 their work well the work that they get paid for and that's that's that a lot of times defines what they think of themselves. And so that that would be interesting to um, to see if um, if you could um, you we anyone uh, could create a spirit where you know like you said value shifting uh, where um, where you can do things that um, well that let you discover that there's a lot of other things in the world um, you know next to or other than. Than your your day job in an office or anywhere like it. it I mean, so yeah. And <laughs> as long as I have the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the word is another thing. It's it's a it's a critical one this time. Um, when I first heard about the project, um, uh, and it's called Baumhaus Treehouse, and I thought there's actually a real tree which has maybe branches 
really huge branches and you built a little cabin in it. And I thought it was, gonna, it was a real tree house. So my question <laughs> is why, why are you making a fake tree house? Why is there, are, you, are, are you making a fake tree in the middle of the thing? Well, I'll tell you why, because in the middle of the room is an 80 centimeter by 80 centimeter column that holds up the, the space. What else are you going to do? Either you can have a giant column in the middle of your space, which is a total detractor <laughs> from the space. Trust me, when you're in there, you're like, whoa, this place would be great if that wasn't here. Yeah. Okay, so what else are you going to do with it? And that's one of my design strategies I've always used when I'm building spaces, is to take the, the thing that's the, the worst part of the space, the, 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 the uh, disadvantage of the space, and turn it into the advantage. And in this context of like, you know, why a treehouse? Because well, we talked about that. It's what you know, we all familiar with what happens to treehouses, the symb symbolism of it, right? So that's why we're building. I mean, is it a fake tree? I mean, fake? I mean, okay, that's interesting. Artificial, real, Kunst, Kunstlich. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's the idea. We're setting up. For, it could be that this fake tree that we build. We inspire much more real things that come out of it. But to me, it's not a treehouse. Isn't the the, 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 uh, the beauty of a treehouse is not derived from the fact that it is a, in a real tree. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the spirit that's behind it and what we do with it. Well, a real tree has a certain I don't know or something. You you can sort of see it's it's alive. It's, it, it is the difference to me. But but of course, I mean, I see all the. Um, I, actually, that's what I wanted to know. You know, that's that was uh, something I'm um, I'm learning because I have no clue about architecture. That you know, that you said <coughs> the distracting thing, the obvious thing in the middle of the room, and turn into something good and some something positive. That's that sort of yeah, that um, satisfies me as an answer. Yeah. But yeah, also I mean, you, we you've talked about being a commercial um, uh, project. But at the same time, you don't want to get rich. Um, so, I mean, it has to do with that. But I, I, um, that you, you are, um, you have to play by the rules of capitalism. You have to make this, this branding. You have to have the logo and everything. That this is the tree house, and then you have all these. You have like a corporate identity, and um, and that, that's yeah, that struck me as a bit odd as well. But I, I can totally see how it's probably pragmatic. Like I. I would have um, music. Uh, I wouldn't have a, a, a better better idea to come up with, I guess. But have you? I mean, what what are your thoughts about that? My thought is that I come from a very activist, uh, radical leftist background, so I felt guilty for a few months playing this project. But my God, I'm doing some business. What am I doing? I'm working with the system, right? And then I thought, okay, but this is something that makes sense to me and it's something we can do something good with that and as I said it's like a way of making it happen, you know. And um, what's the alternative? Can it really have a space where we work where I work then like six hours per day for the for the Green Party doing some kind of job in the office for being able to finance running a small space like at night, you know, in I or to get like a hard sphere and then try to do that. So it's um, I, I think it's um, just you need to play with the system because uh, because uh, we need money to live and to finance the space unless we find a place to get to squat it and don't get kicked out like all people do in Berlin at the moment. So um, and I also think there's there's potential in this idea of the social business. I mean, it's always a question how far you go, but um, you know, it's it's get at the moment you get lots of funding for starting social business and it will get bigger. So when we actually can use this to make this stuff happen, you know, it's it, it's it's a potential to get stronger. Do you think? Um